Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musicians. Coming to you from Santa Monica, this is Score the Podcast. I'm your host, Kenny Holmes, with my co-host, Robert Kraft. And hey, we're Kenny. rolling, baby. It's episode two now. Episode two, and I'm so excited to get to the conversation with Harry Gregson Williams, one of my great, great friends and fant- a fantastic composer. Yeah, and we're in his new digs. This is a nice place. Listen, I, I am so pleased. I wish we had a, uh, a little visual with the podcast just to show we'll this put some pictures up we can put some pictures up just a sunny wonderful room full of musical instruments a really interesting place to work and we're also joined every week by our executive producer running the board matt schrader hey guys i'm matt hey um and like robert mentioned today's guest you know him from big movies the rock enemy of the state the incredibly successful shrek series kingdom of heaven chronicles of narnia also the video game world Metal Gear Solid, mm. Call of Duty, mm. Advanced Warfare. So many great ones, yeah. He's a Golden Globe nominated and nine-time BMI winning composer, Harry Gregson Williams. Yeah, Harry. He'll be joining us. Also in today's episode, a Behind the Source, behind the Score segment. Ooh, Behind the Source might be a whole new show. That's another. That's a different segment. We'll get so. to that one later. Uh, and it features Randy Newman, David Newman, all, all kinds of Newman. Newman! The Newman and, Legacy, yep. And uh, uh, Quincy Legacy. Jones. Alfred Newman, yep. Quincy Jones in there, too. Yeah, it's all about Alfred Newman. Plus, it's back. Harry's going to go against us in Name That Score. Can we and do what's, it? what's the topic, Matt? Uh, the topic, superheroes. Can we Name just say that, that score. score. Can I just interject that Alfred Newman and the Newman legacy is a huge part of my life because I inherited a, a job and literally a chair that Alfred Newman invented. He was the first head of music at Fox right. for over 20 years he actually gave the gig to his brother Lionel Newman wow. so it really is the Newman legend the legacy uh, and I was lucky to sit in that chair in that office and then we named the scoring stage at Fox the Newman scoring yes. stage after I've the been there We've incredible been there. family yep so how awesome. wonderful we're going to do a little behind the score on Alfred Newman. So, yeah, we're excited. We're here in Harry Gregson Williams Studios. Uh, we do want to jump into some news real quick, a couple of cool headlines. Um, John Williams has donated all of his scores to Juilliard. Uh, Williams, of course, attended Juilliard, and he was quoted in this press release saying, Since my earliest days as a fledgling piano student, I've looked up to the Juilliard School as the mecca for the study of music in our country and beyond. It's therefore my privilege to donate my sketches, papers, scores, and scores to Juilliard to be made available to those students particularly interested in the intimate processes of film scoring. Now, Robert, you've taught at schools um, what does that access mean to a student? I mean, these are things that probably that's haven't a even been seen. Trove, isn't it? Yeah, it is a that's like a museum. Trove. I think that it also is uh, an incredible indication that the study of film music has now really become serious. Uh, it's part of academia to have, first of all, John Williams, of course, the maestro of maestros. So looking at those scores and sketches and his notes would be fascinating. But you think about who else is at Juilliard and who else is being studied at Juilliard to have the great American film music original, John Williams, and his work represented there. It says a lot not only about the generosity of John Williams, but where film music has come in the early part of the 21st century. Well, and, and you got to look at it like, you know, that that's, I don't even know what if you could put a price on that, but to just donate that flat out, it just shows what he thinks of you know the future of film music and wanting to to give that back. It's so interesting because you know as he's as he's creating all of this, I'm sure there's like a lot of things that become super valuable. You don't really realize along the way that it's it's going to become super valuable. You know that's something that other people can learn from for for decades or centuries even. That could be an entire museum. Yeah. Um, another yeah. Uh, headline. This was from Variety. Uh, Steven Spielberg apparently had held a super secret table read for an undisclosed project, but as we all know, it's never that secret, because obviously they're reporting on it. Um, Variety has learned that the project is an untitled biopic on conductor and composer Leonard Bernstein. Uh, Bernstein, who coincidentally oh. wrote the music for West Side Story, which Spielberg is also considering taking on a reboot after he does uh, Indiana Jones 5. 
Uh, Bernstein would have been turning 100 this year. He passed away in 1990. Wow. And uh, he was, of course, one of the first conductors born and educated in the United States to receive worldwide acclaim. And you know, there's a, there's a kind of an organic segue here because as revealed in the film that we all made, Score, John Williams started as a studio piano player and one of the scores that he played on is the film score for West Side Story, Leonard Bernstein's great, incredible first Broadway show and then Hollywood movie. I, I was wondering though, wouldn't you think Spielberg would want to do a biopic on John Williams wow. if he was going to do something? Wouldn't or is he just going to become the director who does biopics on composers? That's amazing. Well, didn't I see in the one of the articles about this Bernstein picture that Steven Spielberg said if he wasn't a director, he would have wanted to be a film composer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and he's famously said that before. I wonder what the reaction would be to a West Side Story remake. Everyone's remaking stuff and people are up in arms about it. I don't know. It's such a classic. I mean, uh, that'll be interesting. All right. Well, plenty to come on Score the Podcast coming up after the break. Golden Globe nominated and nine-time BMI winning composer Harry Gregson Williams joins us. We will be right back. Hi, Film Score fans. Matt Schrader here from Score the Podcast. We need your support as we launch into this competitive podcast world. If you like what you're hearing, tell a friend. We're working to bring you the best guests possible from the music of the screen. Better yet, leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks for telling a friend and supporting Score. Hey, we're back with Harry Gregson Williams, our guest today, the fantastic HGW. I've had the pleasure of working with Harry on a number of pictures, but for those that aren't as familiar with his magnificent opus, Harry, famous for pictures like The Rock and oh. Ants, Enemy of the State, Shrek, Man on Fire, which we worked on together, Kingdom of Heaven, Chronicles of Narnia, The Town, Prometheus, and The Martian. So we are, I couldn't be happier to be here with Harry, who I've known for, I think we're up to at least 711 years. We are. Robert, do you remember when you first came into my studio and met me? I've got a distinct tell image. Me, tell me. I'll tell you, it was on a film called Light It Up. Oh, fabulous. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm not sure anybody will remember that film. But it was a big moment for me because it was, a, I think it was the first Fox film I ever worked on. Mm. And obviously you were, the, you were the boy there at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was told that the craft would be visiting me at my, in my lair at Media Ventures. And I wasn't quite sure what to expect. The craft? I've, yeah. <laughs> That's a new name for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, yeah, TK. Um, yeah. So, so we, you know, I was, I was thinking, you know, this, this pro probably, you know, I, I wasn't quite sure what, what, a, what a music executive would look like or how he'd behave. <laughs> um, but there was a knock at the door before I could say, come in. Um, he flew in, sat at the piano, and he was off. He was, he was <laughs> playing something. And I thought, oh, okay. Oh, I see. That's funny. The music executive's musical. Ah. He actually likes and understands music. I, I wonder it. if it was either, uh, you know, Robert Kraft, the show off, which <laughs> was part of it, or I just always liked to try out different pianos yeah. and thought, I'll just check it out. That was lovely. Play something and... It set the tone for our relationship. It was uh, all, all about the music. It was so nice. And that actually was an interesting picture. Usher was in the movie. Yeah, that's, that's and right. Forrest Whitaker was uh -huh. a, a good one. Um, Harry, let's... We should maybe just reminisce for a moment about a couple pictures that we worked on together. Yeah. And I, I picked some of these clips mostly because... I just dug the music so much, and I was lucky enough to be next to it. But one of the strange and wonderful things about what you do is often you score pictures that not enough people see, but the music remains forever memorable. And one of those was Phone Booth. And I I just remember thinking, I don't know a lot about the how you and Joel worked out what the result would be, but there was a, a feeling in the music there that was, it actually was kind of somewhere between sound effect and percussion and music that I thought this extends what film scoring should and can be. I have a cue here, which was called the rifle. Yes, I remember it well. Well, if you, if you, stick, a, if you stick a guy in a phone booth for 90 minutes. That was my need, question. You need to build some tension How from you, somewhere. And in a cue like this, 
you know, you think about movie music, you think it's going to be melodic and this yeah, is really... You know, well, that, that did how did you down, arrive at that? I did go down a bit of a rabbit hole then because it was, <clears throat> you know, um, you know, when I started out and um, where I am today, I think of harmony and melody pretty much first. Hmm. And I'm not thinking of giving you a droney score or a percussion score. I'm thinking nowadays, and certainly when I started out, that, that, that everything would probably hinge on harmony and melody. Mm -hmm. uh, but I came to that film, and Joel had already had it scored a little bit, and he wanted it to, he wanted it done differently. <clears throat> so he came to me because I'd just done Veronica Guerin for him, this film oh, with Kate Blanchett. Right. Yeah, and uh, and and uh, I had just a few weeks to do it, and he said, "Look, how about you, you? Because Veronica Guerin was quite a melodic, harm, harmony-driven score. Why don't you, why, why, why don't you just base this all on percussion, the kind of the sounds of the street?" You know, the whole thing's set in a street in New York in a phone booth, you know. Um, and so that was one approach. But I kind of left, it was the first score where I didn't, I don't think there was any orchestra in it at all, nothing. There were a couple of, you know, actual instruments that I played, like, like for instance, a piano. But, but then I kind of reversed it and screwed with it massively. So oh, you wouldn't really, really, really know it was a piano. But it was, it was, it was a little nerve-wracking because I did it. And then, you know, then the, then the temptation was to go on from there. And and forget where I my my initial aim was to, you know, if I came, I, of course I came out of the the Zimsky camp, which was all about <laughs> you know these kind of block choruses, mm -hmm. al almost like verse chorus verse chorus, mm -hmm. and you, you bang you with a tune in you know, a different key, or yeah. you know he just d d done all those 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 sort of big Jerry Bruckheimer actiony type That's things, right. and um, yeah. and uh, not that I was wanting to go down that path, but it was very clear that. The phone booth for me was um, a bit of a weird one because it was out of that box completely. And the other thing that it did do for me actually gave me confidence to to think that I could get through a film score without touching the orchestra. It's incredible. It's um, all heart pounding, constant, just <laughs> yeah. And it's 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 um, these days I don't think I doubt. I mean, when I set out to do um, let's think uh, Total Recall, maybe mm -hmm. futuristic thing, The Martian. You know, I didn't set out thinking I got to use the orchestra, but I did fall back on it. Hmm. Uh, but there's the, both of those are quite um, quite synth led, but there's definitely an element that's that's uh, that's organic and breathing and played the orchestral element. But on the phone booth thing, it was it was okay. We're just going to set the side, and so I was kind of left with uh, okay. Well, w what else is there? What else can I lean on? And it seemed to be percussion and a few synths, and I didn't really have much experience of that, so I had to make it up as I went on a bit. I um, think you actually led into a new kind of film scoring. Well, yes, I don't know that anybody's going to thank me for that. I, <laughs> what, you mean the unmelodic, droney, percussion-y led <laughs> piece of crap that we sometimes well, get landed Or in. a non-manipulative, right. emotional score that just mm. says we're going to provide an environment yeah. to you, score. You mentioned The Martian. Uh, the last time we spoke with you when we were shooting Score, the documentary, yeah, yeah. you said that you were heading off to work with Ridley on The Martian, you mentioned it was a space movie, but you didn't want to do the same old space sound, but you, you weren't quite sure Whatever where you is. were going to go with that. No. Um, no and right. Fresh off of Gravity, fresh off of Interstellar. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, I didn't, I'm one of the f few people who very unpolitically correctly didn't really get Gravity. The film, I loved most of the film. Didn't buy the last 20, you know, Sandra Bullock landing on Earth from space and swimming to the shore. I was like, oh, okay, forget that. <laughs> I mean, kind of like Jesus. Penguin. No, I, yeah, quite. <laughs> it's like, what? Wah. And then, and sort of musically, I thought, you know, the, the, obviously the lad did well, didn't he? Because, you know, he hadn't got much experience with composer, so I didn't, didn't begrudge him his Oscar and all that stuff. But I didn't get it. I wasn't left with much. I didn't really hear much. So, so anyhow, so starting out in the Martian, it's not like I was tempted to say, oh, got to get into that groove of yeah. gravity. We, like, have oh, a, okay. we have a cue from the Martian we want to play really quick here. Uh -oh. oh, yeah. So when, when you're approaching this, you say you don't want to take the space. It still has a little bit of space feel, but it's it's very melodic. It's it's different. Yeah. Um, well, what was got, the approach with uh, that? The, 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 the music should be quite up, uppity. I mean, uh, he's a really positive guy, the Matt Damon character. He's got a lot lot of positivity. I mean, the guy, poor guy, <laughs> guy's the only guy on the planet, you know. And instead of feeling sorry for himself and just just packing it in and dying, <laughs> he's you know he's, he sciences the shit out of it, and 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 so the music is a little techy, the bo -bo 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 -bo, all these little arpeggiated synths going, <laughs> and you know a little bit of melody. You'll notice the melody seems to be ever rising. Yeah, it's actually not. It, it doubles back on itself, so it just gives the impression that it's being dong 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 dong, as if he's you know he's he's, he's 
progressing. He's, yeah, he's progressing, and he's he's trying to he's trying to build blocks to get off this planet. But um, yeah, with my approach with that one was um, we'll suck it and see. Really, I would started with a bunch of synths and layered in some melody. Um, but you know what? <clears throat> that was mine to screw up. I mean, look, when a movie is that well written, that well acted, that well directed, what are you going to do? I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, it was just embarrassing that everybody else got nominated for God knows what. All, all the all the craft things, you know, the editing and the production design. And the music got left behind. So obviously it didn't, I didn't quite nail it for most people. But oh, from I my, think you did. Mm, I love sure. that score. But from my, from my part, point of view, it was... You know, mine not to mess up. So I hope at least I achieved that. Oh, I, I love Because, you know, it. it would have been really sad. If the, love that Yeah, score. that movie would have been so good if the, short, the score would have just shut up from it. So I had to, like, tuck myself in there and not be too ostentatious and just let the film be as great as it was. Sometimes I guess that's sort of the both the beauty and the hard part of being the composer, which is yeah. you just have to be the team player that supports yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, I, I like to be that. I don't, yeah. I don't wish to be anything else, actually. A lot more to come. We got to take a quick break, you guys. Uh, but first, behind the score. Behind the score, the inside stories from Hollywood's greatest filmmakers and composers. In Hollywood, you won't find a more legendary name in music than Newman. While Thomas and David Newman have thrived as composers the last 30 years, their cousin Randy Newman topped the pop music charts as a singer songwriter only to become an accomplished film composer himself. They may be the most talented generation of Newman so far, but not the most influential. My father was Alfred Newman, was at 20th Century Fox for 20 years running the music department. That's David Newman, son of Alfred, considered perhaps the godfather, or even one of the creators of film music. I mean, if you go back into the history of Western art and music, plays that were maybe in the 19th century called melodramas would, would have... Uh, music in them to enhance the, the the drama, and enhance the the emotions. It's 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 another tool that the the storytellers, whoever they are, you know, whether it's an opera, melodrama, play, or now uh, movies is essentially a modern um, offshoot of that kind of drama. Alfred and the Fox Orchestra began implementing new techniques to heighten the emotion captured by the camera. Our brains work, in my opinion, in duality. You can feel happy and sad at the same time. That's very hard to do visually. With music, that's something that you can do. One of the films he did there is a movie called All About Eve. The main title to that movie has this triumphant, beautiful, lush music that at the same time feels hopeful, heroic, and beautiful, and terribly sad, and terribly um, wistful for the past. Painting with emotion, Alfred tailored his Fox Orchestra to the precise timing of the actors and edits of a film. But what does the camera do? You know, the, 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 the choice of where you put the camera and, and uh, the words you choose to have the characters say. That's Randy Newman, who still idolizes his Uncle Alfred. Well, I happen to have seen p big pieces of Weathering Heights and Gone with the Wind without music. And he did a lot for, a lot for those pictures. It's remarkable. The magic is the Fox Orchestra. Everyone, every second, is phrasing, meaning they are figuring out how that line of music works in its musical context and in its dramatic context. And they got so good at it, the principles and everything. He, he had the technique. Alfred even developed new methods to capture the sound of an orchestra. The mics were there to blend the orchestra, meaning you don't want to hear that violin there louder. You want to hear it as one section. He did uh, uh, How the West Was Won, which was done at MGM, which is now Sony. If you go up in the rafters there, we'll climb up in the, in the fly space above, you can see the mark where they hung the microphone. They did a whole session there just hanging microphones figuring out where the best place was to hang the mic microphone. There's a vision to it. He had a sound, he had a sound. Alfred's musical style caught the attention of aspiring musicians everywhere. Alfred Newman was bigger than the movie stars out there. Including a young Quincy Jones. You know, I used to go to movies and 
11 cent movies and clear hooking from school. And after a while, I could recognize all of the music that came out of 20th Century Fox influenced by Alfred Newman. A few years later, Jones and Newman would become friends in Hollywood. He taught me the, to believe in your blink, your intuition. And we used to go over to his house and his sons, like Thomas Newman, all of them, they were bowling with his Oscars. <laughs> he had them like bowling pins, you know. He had eight Oscars and they were bowling with them. They turned out to be good composers, too. Alfred Newman is still a sacred name in Hollywood, a pioneer who revolutionized the art form. In his honor, Fox renamed the studio where Alfred recorded so many of his great film scores. To this day, the Newman scoring stage is considered one of the preeminent music recording facilities in the world. For more stories behind the score, read Score, the interviews, based on the international hit film Score, a film music documentary featuring raw insight from Hans Zimmer, James Cameron, Quincy Jones, Randy Newman, Trent Reznor, and many more. Score, the interviews, available now at score-movie.com. Hey, we're back with Harry Gregson Williams. Just wonderful to be together We after working together on so many great movies. In your nice new studio, too. A beautiful well, studio. We were at a different studio for Score, the documentary, but this is beautiful. Yeah, no, this still smells of new car, doesn't it? Yeah. I like that smell. I think <laughs> yeah. you can actually buy that it smell. Probably, probably, it. Well, it's probably due to the fact that I don't smoke 40 cigarettes a day in it anymore. Interesting. <laughs> Good I mean, I, never ha I have, never have done in, in this iteration, but you, vis you visited me in my... My lair in, uh, in Venice, right? It's so sunny yes. and beautiful. Yeah. Just so nice here. Yeah, I'm surprised you were able to see me through the, the fog of smoke. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it, it was, was an effect. <laughs> <laughs> Creating the ambiance. Dramatic. <laughs> kind of a cinematic effect. We worked on Kingdom of Heaven. We did. Um, we Ooh, was, yes, we did. Yeah, another Ridley Scott? Another Ridley Scott. We went to Abbey Road Took together. Some time. And yes. um, there was a cue in that one mm. that I always loved. It was, I think the name of it, I can't pronounce it, mm. is... Ibelin. Ibelin, yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. And where she goes to get water. Yeah, They're looking yeah. for water. Yeah. Do we have that one, Matt? A and... Yeah. It's the mood. I think you actually... That was one of my questions, the oud. I didn't know until I read a little bit about you that you had spent some time in Alexandria. Yeah, no, it's, I'd... You taught there? Yeah, in, middle, in the Middle East, I, um, <coughs> in Alexandria, Egypt. Yeah, I spent 18 months teaching out there, actually, teaching music. And, and did this... Uh, I, it just occurred to me when I was thinking of Kingdom of Heaven, yeah. when I read about that Alexandria experience, anything there that well, you I brought the Kingdom of Heaven? Look, listen, the, the sights and sounds. At that time, I wasn't composing music for anything mm. other than my pupils. <laughs> wow. You know, I'd, I... No, I, I was, uh, you know, as a vocationally, I... You could say I came. Were you just thinking about being a film composer? No, I was, the thought hadn't even crossed my mind until <laughs> way after I was teaching in Alexandria. Hadn't crossed my mind. Um, so I was a bit of a late starter because, as you know, I'm I'm very young still. Thank However, you. I was in my middle thirties when the thought crossed my mind. Incredible. I wasn't like right out of you know uh, right out of music college. I thought, what the hell am I going to do? I didn't come play in an orchestra. I wasn't good enough. I didn't have enough patience. Um, I didn't want to sing in a choir. I'd done that as a little chap. Um, hmm. I didn't know what I was going to do, and coming out of music college, I thought the best thing I could do was to is to teach the stuff that I love and that, that I know. I had really good teachers myself, but going back to when I was six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, really, really great, amazing, inspiring teachers. So I felt like I knew it wasn't so. You know, I was, it was only ten years after that 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 I come out of music college. I felt I still could remember. Hmm. how it was to be taught by and um, what what I would want to be taught. Had and I, how'd you end up in Alexandria? Well, no, <laughs> I'll tell you why, very simply. So I did five or six years of teaching in a, in a private school, in a little boys' school, the kind of school that I went to, boarding mm -hmm. school, um, uh, right out of music college, that five years. And I thought, I woke up one morning, I thought, well, I'm going to blink and it'll be 20 years. This will be my life, which would have been great. I absolutely loved every minute that I taught music and sports, the two things that I'm good at, the two things I like. Hmm. Um, you know, these are sports that you wouldn't understand, Robert. Sorry. <laughs> Cricket. No, I don't <laughs> know. Football. Uh, football. No, yeah. It's what you call soccer. Right. Um, um, <laughs> Very British. And, and, and rugby, you see. You know, it's a Completely. bit of a, a rugger bugger. Right. Uh, yeah. So, um, so I, you know, after five years of teaching in this, this little boys' school, this boarding school, I thought I've really got to do something a bit more challenging. Now, I hadn't, after my music degree, <laughs> I hadn't gone on to get, you know, a teacher's diploma. So mm. I wasn't actually officially allowed to teach in the schools in England, like the, 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 the government schools. 
But, you know, you could do anything in a private school. Anybody could hire you. Sure. So I should have really progressed to teaching in a normal school where kids, you know, didn't have to pay to be there. And it was, you know, not boarding schools. But I couldn't because I wasn't going to go back to, you know, do a two-year sort of teacher training thing. Uh, so I thought, well, okay, I could teach abroad because I don't care. Perfect. Uh, so I just looked in the back of the Times. It has this Times educational supplement. Uh, every week, and, uh, and there was this really, really strange job, which would require me to go to uh, Alexandria and Cairo for about a year and a half, and go into many of the schools there, and ascertain and give a report at the end of the eighteen months as to what I thought about the music in schools and how I thought it should progress, and how, what sort of teachers they should do. Which, by the way, I sorted out in about six weeks. So, that I spent I spent a year and a half having fun, going into all these schools, trying to inspire the kids, and and teaching two things that um, actually they. <laughs> To be honest, they weren't interested in cricket. <laughs> but yeah, the, so I was there in Persia, Persia, as it were. And yeah, yeah and many years later, to do Kingdom of Heaven, the sights and sounds and smells of the the markets there and the, and the constant, uh, the, you know, the the the, right. the the mosque, you know, the right. call, call to prayer. Yeah, yeah. But uh, no, no, I wouldn't say I, I I could like really lean on anything that I, uh, that experience. But you know, I did. I'm 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 wise enough to actually hire people who know better than me. In my film scoring, I don't think I know every. I know I don't know everything I need to know. For instance, on Kingdom of Heaven, I had a really, really good friend. I still have a very good friend called Hugh Marsh, who'd collaborated with me many, many times, playing electric violin on many of my scores. Um, and he, I know, had a, he, I knew, had a big relationship with musicians in uh, Istanbul. Hmm. Uh, and when we were in London, you know, Ridley was saying, you know, I'm not hearing enough sort of Turkish or Persian inflections. I said, well, you know, we're, we're going to add them. He said, well, I'd like to kind of hear them. So I got Hugh to come over. Hugh lives in Toronto. I got him to fly, flew him over to, to London and, and packed him off to Istanbul with a cue like Iblin, which didn't sound like that. It was all the melody, harmony was all there, but there was no, there was no oud on it. There was no, there was none, none of these, these wonderful inflections. I packed him off there with four or five of my cues. Um, and with, with, with musical charts. And he came back with, with a lot of stuff I had to edit, but, you know, all the flavors. The fantastic we part about hearing this is as the executive in charge of music, I should have known all this <laughs> and said, yes, I totally understand. <laughs> but well, no, you, the, way, the way that that you film was... You made me look good. No, but the way that that film was structured is it was... It, and often this is, this is actually really... It, um, it encourages creativity is that, you know, there was a certain amount of money for musicians. And you, Fox had said, look, this is it, Harry. Don't go over it. Don't even think about that. But, you know, knowing that Ridley would probably make me write three, four hours of music, all that needed to be recorded and then cut down, which he did. So it was a very expensive score to, to knock out. But you gave me a, you know, I was given a, a figure and told not to exceed it. So within that figure, we're like, OK, well, i got to fly Hugh out here. We need to pay these musicians in, in Istanbul, or whatever it was. And that was no one Fantastic. blinked. You know, they're like, OK, this is great. This is what we need. Harry, I know for a fact, I actually have been a part of this at some point, but that you have come in to rescue a couple movies. I remember once seeing Team America on a screen in your in your studio in Venice, and you said, yeah, I did it in, forgive me if I've mistakenly remembered this, 10 days. Yeah. The, the, what is it like to rescue a movie when somebody comes to you and says, Is say, that terrifying? What, it's what gotta we, be scary. Yeah. Well, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word rescue because, <clears throat> um, well, in that instance, possibly. But um, it's a well-known fact. I've never made any secret of this. That if you, you know, if you expect me to score a film that needs 88 minutes of music in 10 days, you're going to get me and a whole bloody team. Now, usually you wouldn't get me. You hire me, you get me. Um, as you know, you've you've met Stephanie mm -hmm. um, Economou, who's my musical assistant here. Mm -hmm. She's my composing assistant. She's my team. Uh -huh. uh, and Paul is my permanent. Paul, Paul Thomason is, is my permanent music editor here. Great. And he's my tech. So that's 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 my team. Now, back in the day at Wavecrest on the beach in mm -hmm. Venice, I did have a team, mm -hmm. which I could sort of uh, deploy if necessary. Good. So, yeah, that was deployed. And I don't know whether you call it rescuing. It's no way to make a score, to be honest. But it was no way to hire a composer. I mean, what, yeah. what do you expect in 10 days? So, yeah, Jablonski, my old assistant, uh, you know, he knocked out a few cues. Um, I don't know. I got everybody from Trevor Raven to God knows who to, to say, look, put your hand in the bag. <laughs> and <laughs> put out a cue right. and don't mess it up. Yeah. Give it to me in a couple of days. And I did as much as I could physically. Um, and that, that was it. So, <clears throat> but, you know, there are, there, are other, there are other scores that um, I wouldn't say rescue, but that I've been able to contribute to. Like, for instance, Prometheus, a mm -hmm. couple of Ridley films. Yeah. Three Ridley films, actually. Prometheus, uh, which I did, 
and basically I came in at the, the, the very end after Mike Streitenfeld had scored the film. And I think Ridley and possibly Mark felt, uh, and definitely Pietro Scalia, the editor, mm -hmm. um, felt that the, they were lacking a little bit in the, in the th a sort of melodic department. Mm -hmm. And Rid asked me if I would, you know, if I could write a theme, a cue that would fit the beginning, the very opening of the film. Yeah. And he could basically slop it around the place. So I said, well, I tell you what, why don't I write a theme? And he's, y you come by and hear it. And he said, well, that would be tomorrow night. I'm like, oh, it's that soon, is it? Okay, once you've heard the theme, he said, great, I'll spot five, six places in this film where you could write I think a variation. It was eight total. Oh, was I eight. remember. Yeah. So what we did was, was basically a theme and variation. So I wrote yeah. the theme for the very beginning and then, then quickly. Uh, you, you know, uh, developed it in these eight places, and then within days, I was on a plane to Abbey Road. I think it was two two sessions, boom, 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 done. So it was very pleasurable. I wow! And it uh, and uh, and but it didn't rescue the film. It was just a contribution. And similar thing happened on um, on the one that uh, the rather good Spanish composer did. I've forgotten his name. It was Exodus, Gods and Kings. Mm. So I uh, Rid said, look, he called me up, said, look, I've I've got a really good composer. It's a Spanish dude, you know, uh, and I said, "Well, I, I, know, I know him. He's really good. What, what's the problem?" He said, "No problem at all. But I'd like, I'd like some of you on this. I'd like you to part the Red Sea, actually, specifically." Lovely. Uh, yes. So I said, "Great, really. Was that by tomorrow night as well?" Was that <laughs> <it>? <laughs> no, yeah, it was a little bit longer. So, so contributing to these things has has always been quite pleasurable. I've, I've kept, I've just made sure that they behave, try and behave properly. I was there's always a, there's a lot of there's a lot of room for. For, for abuse here, isn't there? And for people getting upset. I just, know? I think one final question I wanted to ask was about that moment in Prometheus. I was under the impression that you were on your time away from Hollywood. No, not on Prometheus. And well, wasn't there a period around then that you decided it was time for you to yeah, exit? Just, I just was curious. Yeah, there was. What, the, after, what after, preceded that that made <coughs> you think it's time to check out for um, a minute? I, I found myself doing a couple of films, which I certainly not release films. Which doesn't matter what they are, but that I didn't really want to be doing mm. stylistically, mm. and I had to ask myself, what, "What are you doing? Why are you doing this?" Well, I was supporting a huge team of people that I had pulled together over fifteen years, mm -hmm. um, and a certain lifestyle that just had, couldn't wasn't it wasn't uh, healthy really in mm. terms of it couldn't really carry on. You know, if I tell you that, you know, that when I rented the big old building that when I moved out of Hans's place you know mm -hmm. I rented found this building rented this building on the beach in Venice the rent was about eight thousand dollars a month it's a lot by the time I left it was twenty four thousand dollars that's wow. even more wow right. that would so, be three and, times and, you know, that's, and I had all these English people you know the phone bill at Wavecrest was bloody ridiculous you know you had <laughs> oh, Buckley God. calling his mum you know <laughs> <laughs> you know whatever uh, no anyhow so it was untenable really yeah. it was fantastic it was brilliant I wouldn't change anything it was mm -hmm. a decade of, um, of much creativity but it just came up thought, okay I've got to stop I've got to renew and regenerate and start again as it were and uh, I had just at that moment as fortune would have it um, uh, I was in I was asked if I would like to go back to the school that taught me all my music in England and teach for a year amazing and I'd be there composing full resident. circle yeah so I, I went back and I taught guess what um, music and sports Cricket. Uh, yeah, I did cricket, rugby, <laughs> uh, and, and music, and I was able to do as little or as much teaching as I wanted, and uh, it was fabulous. And my wife, and at that time, three children, I have five now, but um, lovely, had never really seen me other than the guy who was rarely home for dinner, the guy who looked wrecked, you know, because he was so tired. The guy was absolutely not adhering to most people's weekend sort of situation. <laughs> Uh, it, and might be around on holidays if you're lucky. So I thought, well, okay, this has got to stop. I don't, it's not how I want to li live the rest of my life. Um, so so we, I went back there, and I was home for dinner, and I had weekends off, and I lived quite quite normally and was able to recharge. I came back, and ha I had disbanded my studio and everybody in it, everybody who sailed in it, and they all had plenty of notice. And anyhow, a lot of these people were, you know, I mentioned Dave Buckley earlier. You know, the guy was doing a hit TV show by then. You know, he'd, he'd had his leg up, and he was, he was, he'd set sail. He didn't need me anymore. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot of these guys who 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 I bought them, they were all fine. They were ready to to leave the nest, as it were. So there was it's no fantastic, and and I must say, brave in a way to say, mm. you know what? At the peak, I mean, you were at mm. that point the peak no, of I know. Hollywood well, composers, well, and suddenly, what happened to Harry? <laughs> well, exactly. Well, hold on a second. <laughs> Sam did tell me when I got back. My agent told me. I said, well, um, <clears throat> I'm going to need to work pretty soon. I haven't really done anything. You know, I'm earning money for you. Um, 
And he said, well, hey, for Christ's sake, most people, even one music executive told, uh, asked me the other day if you'd retired. I said, well, what are you talking about, retired? Well, I'll never uh, retire. Great. Yeah, so there was a misconception, but I had to get, I was very fortunate, actually, that Antoine Fuqua called me just towards the end of my sabbatical and said, you know, I'm doing The Equalizer. Why don't we get together again? Because we'd, we'd done a film many years before The yep. Replacement Killers. Perfect. So that was a good one. Well, as they say in England, well played. <laughs> Thank you. Well played. And we're going to play Name That Score coming up after the break, speaking of well played. And the theme is superheroes. We'll be right back. Hey, Matt Schrader here, director of Score, a film music documentary. For the latest news from the film music world, follow us on Facebook. Just search Score, a film music documentary. Or let us know who you want to hear next on the show on Twitter at score the podcast we're back here inside the studios of harry gregson williams our guest today and uh we're about to get right into it it's time for name that score get ready to play name that score the film music game where a perfect score means you, yes you, could be a winner. Now let's play Name That Score. Can't get enough of that intro. I'm All always right. concerned that people think that is a serious <laughs> approach <laughs> to podcasting, but let them believe that and we will I, I go think it's tastefully ahead. done. Uh, oh, so tasteful. But, uh, uh, so a quick reminder how this works, um, and for Harry, who, who uh, has Doesn't never know. heard this before. Harry, you're going to uh, win a prize play, for some lucky listener. Oh, good. Uh, it, maybe. Uh, maybe. We play five uh, relatively famous film scores, but in reverse... Um, you choose from one of the multiple choice answers. Okay. The final question is worth double points. If anybody gets all the questions right, we give away a prize uh, on our Twitter account. All you have to do is mention at score the podcast on Twitter. Uh, and because the best scores have a theme, so does this game. Today's theme is superheroes. Uh, so these are themes from fairly prominent superhero movies over the last uh, couple decades. Um, and uh, I think we can jump right into this for question one. Is that The Dark Knight, The Amazing Spider-Man by James Horner, or The Avengers? I'd say it was The Dark Knight, judging by the horrible brass sound. <laughs> Very interesting. I'm going with Harry's guesses on all of them. Whatever Harry says, I agree. No, no, I wouldn't. I'm so not <laughs> efficient. You've chosen superhero movies. The very movies I won't go and see. I'm going to go with Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Kenny's always a ringer in this. Nobody got it right. Oh, oh. man. The Avengers. Oh, okay. Alan Sorry about Silvestri. the brass. I'm sure the brass sounded horrible just because it was backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> players. <laughs> all right. Sorry, Twitter. Okay. Put your phones away. Zero. We all stuck. We all, all right. Oh for one. Up. We uh, suck. Kenny, Kenny uh, got them all right last uh, the last episode here. Sorry, so uh, that's your, that's his first your miss. Era is over. Question two. We'll give you the undefeated. answers first. Question two is this: Superman by John Williams, Guardians of the Galaxy, Tyler Bates, or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles by Brian Tyler. How would I know? Oh, that one sounds the same backwards. That, I can that, get sounds, that. that sounds like John Williams. Right? That, was, that was Superman. I'm going Superman. Yeah. I'm super. In. Even I. Everybody? Can super. Yes. Got it. Right on. Oh, a clean sweep. Now we're. We're back. We're rocking. <laughs> it's back lucky that roll. that is correct. <laughs> Otherwise, that some shameful ripoff has happened. <laughs> Number three, what do we got? Some of these John Williams ones sound the same backwards or like it's another. Yeah. They, they, what was it? It was Indiana kind of... Jones sounded like Star Wars. Backwards. Mm -hmm. Looks like him, too. Question three. What's oh, Hans? Oh yeah, we know what that is. I know. So what this is. one's a little tricky because we have uh, yeah, a couple. Adam. We got a couple options: Batman Begins, oh, okay. and The oh, Dark Knight. Oh good God, you're going to split oh, hairs. Man. And, and, and X Men. <laughs> Even if it was forward, it's not X Men. So it's one of those Batman things, isn't it? It's probably the first one. I mean, the the original one. I'm going to go Batman Begins just because I think you're going to try and school us. Yeah, Robert. What was the second one after Batman Begins? The Dark Knight. Oh, God. Yes. Yeah, you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. This is from the Dark Knight. So yeah. Robert oh, gets that point. Just total guesswork. They're high five now. There's a one oh one. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. So I got a point. 
So question three. Um, that was three. This is uh, question four. You're right. Uh, is this, and right now we got Robert in the lead. Uh, one. <laughs> yeah. With one. Uh, two questions We're in left. Big trouble <laughs> and Robert with leading. one. The last, uh, the last question worth one point, the, and the uh, fifth question's worth double. Here's question four. Is this Hellboy by Marco Beltrami, Watchmen by Tyler Bates, or Iron Man by Ramin Jawadi? I think, I think I know this. Not because I know the scores, but because I happen to know that Ramin bled in a bunch of electric guitars, so I reckon it's his one. I don't know the other score. So I, I was going to go Tyler Bates because of the guitar. Oh, <laughs> so oh, he, he, oh. he does that, does he? Oh, I, yeah. I, Harry had an instinctive moment when he heard the first two notes, and I thought, <laughs> I'm going with that. Oh, God. This is Iron Man. Oh, Harry. It's yeah. a high five. You, Those and guitars. you said, very you, said you weren't awesome. going to do well. I'm in last place. The only place thing is here. that's ripped Robert Wright to the lead. Isn't <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yeah, Damn. It, it, thank you so much. It was like an assist, which is kind of a soccer thing. Yeah, we need to do football. this like on a on But a, what's really interesting, which I never thought in this game, is that doing it with Harry, he is hearing inside a composer's approach to scoring backwards. <laughs> <laughs> which is really an amazing skill and set. look how far that got me. <laughs> right. So right now, uh, the Robert's big... in the lead by one. The last yeah. question's worth double. So we go. it comes down to Hit this. Me. Last question. Hit me with your Is this stick. The Matrix, a uh, borderline superhero movie? Don Wonder Davis? Woman by uh, Hans Zimmer and uh, Junkie XL, Tom what Hulkenberg. Was, sorry, what was the name of the second one? Uh, it's The Matrix, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. And Iron Man 2 by last week's guest, John Debney. Oh, I think we know this one. Yeah, it's Wonder Woman. Oh, yeah, it sounds the same backwards. Yeah. <laughs> it's you another could, one of those. Often when you have a two-note ostinato, they do sound the same backwards. No, sorry, Tom. All right. I so, have to say Wonder Woman real quick. <laughs> <laughs> Even after you, were nodding, you were nodding along. So I, was I, nodding I was already out. We knew so where you were. I could have said anything. Isn't it in 7-8 as well? How do I do? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's kind of a... Yeah. It's distinctive. Um, we'll play uh, our close, but Robert is our winner. That hey is now. really remarkable. Well, Redemption. All right. Well, we want to take a second to uh, thank Harry for letting us come in your studio and bother you while you're working on some magic over here. A reminder to our listeners, this is a new show, and uh, we're trying to help it grow. So if you could do us a favor, tell a friend. Uh, also, make sure to subscribe to us on iTunes. Also, follow us on Twitter, at Score the Podcast. And if you want to watch Score, a film music documentary, which features Harry Granks and Williams, and along with many others, uh, go to score-movie.com. You can pick that up. Thank you so much. Harry, what a treat to spend okay. time with you. Well, thanks for coming, guys. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs>